Welcome to Nonviolent Communication, uh, a workshop in social emotional leftism, socialist emotional learning. Um, for anyone unfamiliar with any of this, um, the thing that we're going to be grounding ourselves in is the purpose of nonviolent communication as defined by Marshall Rosenberg, which is to create the quality of connection such that everyone's needs get met. Um, the way I frame that is that that's a two-parter. It's creating the quality of connection and then getting everyone's needs met. Like both of those things are really important. Um, there is, you know, like if you don't have a quality of connection such that your needs get met very naturally, it might take a lot more effort and a lot more checking in. Um, and if you have a, a deep and intimate relationship with someone that is very long standing, you know each other super well, you might not even ever need to use words to know like, oh, that's what this person needs right now. I'm, I'm gonna help them meet their need with that. Um, and, uh, and it's so it's a two parter in, in creating that uh, relationality such that we, uh, we live fulfilled lives in that way. Um, and we'll talk more about the needs and everything as we go. Um, one thing to talk about is, uh, to be clear, uh, cause people have baggage. Some people have some baggage with nonviolent communication around, um, what nonviolent communication is not. And nonviolent communication is very clearly not, uh, something that we weaponize to get our way to get what we want. And it's not something that we use to tone police or gaslight other people. Um, has that been done? Yes, uh, people do it and it's fucked up and wrong. Um, and it violates my needs for uh, relationality and connection and integrity. Um, and uh, I would, uh, if you have those experiences, I would just ask that you hold uh, the idea that uh, it's not the fault of the nonviolent communication. Um, just the way that whoever, uh, was harming people with the English language, it's not the fault of the English language. I have, I can critique the English language about, but, uh, it's not responsible for everything that people do with it. Okay. So, uh, it's not for weaponizing, tone pleasing, nonviolent communication is also not really about, uh, nonviolence or communication per se. Uh, the reason that it has the name nonviolent communication is twofold. One is that uh, it's a lot easier to talk about the words that we use in communicating with other people than it is to talk about the frameworks or perspectives or consciousnesses that we move through the world with. Um, so the, the words are proxies, right? Like I can say, I love you in a way that is actually disrespecting you and what your needs are. And I can say, Hey, douchebag in a way that engenders the quality of connection that gets everybody's needs met. Um, so it's not actually about the words, but the words are proxies for what we're talking about. Um, so that's the idea there. So great. what is nonviolent communication then? And especially what does it mean to practice something that we call nonviolent in the context of white supremacy, uh, and the violence that inhabits the planet? Um, so, uh, we'll, we'll get into like NVC, uh, proper, uh, like mainstream, whatever. And then we'll, we'll bring that into those, those kinds of contexts. Um, but the idea there is that, uh, NVC is about needs. Needs are the thing that get centered, um, and your needs that are being met and your needs that are not being met and how we can meet your needs. Um, and those are the things that, that we are really focused on. Um, and feelings, if we're looking at this like a target, right, feelings are uh, close to needs and they're very helpful, but we don't stop with feelings. Feelings are the clues as to what our needs are. If we're feeling unpleasant feelings, that's a clue that our needs are not being met or maybe even being violated or whatever the case may be. Um, if we're feeling pleasant feelings, that's a clue that our needs are being met. Um, and if we're feeling a mix, which is most often the case, that's a clue that we're having mixed relationships with our needs and something's going on there and we can parse those out. Uh, observations are the, the things that are actually happening around us. And those are also clues, right? So, uh, if someone, uh, gives me a hug, that's an observation and I might feel pleasant feelings or unpleasant feelings about that. And that tells me that the 
hug that happened uh, is either meeting my needs or not. Um, that's the, the, the basic target concept of uh, nonviolent communication. And if, if this is a target board and we throw our dart and we're totally off of the, the mark and we hit the wall, then we're in the realm of moralistic judgments. Um, moralistic judgments being the, these four ones that uh, the white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal domination culture imposes are right, wrong, should, should not, good or bad, or good or evil. Those are the big ones, and those are totally off the mark. This is basically nonviolent communication in a nutshell. But uh, while this is simple, um, it is also uh, difficult to practice and hard precisely for the reason that this is exactly an inverse of uh, white supremacist patriarchal domination culture. Um, the thing that gets centered in such domination culture is these moralistic judgments. Is uh, if you think about like what kinds of questions we ask about uh, what we are doing and what other people are doing throughout the day, right? Um, what do you think about this? Should I do this or should I not do this? Is this good or bad? Can you believe this person? Aren't they fucked up and wrong for this thing? Or like, wow, that was such a good thing to do, right? And how often do we ask, like, what am I feeling in my body right now? Uh, where is that showing up? Why is that there? What, what needs are being met by me right now? What would meet my needs? What would meet your needs right now? How often do we ask those kinds of questions? So the idea here is that um, it is hard precisely because we are practiced in the inverse of nonviolent communication all the time. And uh, that there's actually a very specific reason for that, that uh, domination, white supremacist patriarchal domination culture wants us to be disconnected from our needs. In fact, um, I'm gonna skip that part just for a second. But in fact, Marshall Rosenberg says, people connected to their needs make very bad slaves. And he means that in a very intentional and political way in that the power structures that be, they can convince us to uh, trade our uh, labor and life force and, and uh, the things that are meeting our needs. They can convince us to do that if they can convince us that doing so would be right and not doing so would be wrong. It's very hard to convince someone to violate their needs if they have a very strong connection and relationship to and can articulate what their needs are. Um, it's, very, it's much easier to convince people to violate their need than the needs of others if, um, if they can say, uh, yeah, well, you know, that's just how the world works and it, that's, uh, that's, that's how we are and like it, for, like it or not, like that's, that's, uh, that's where you're at. And if you don't do this, then, then you're going to be punished. And punishments, rewards and punishments are exactly how we enforce these moralistic judgments. All the moralistic judgments are based in what people deserve. Um, and I emphasize moralistic judgments because Marshall Rosenberg says very clearly, like we, Marshall Rosenberg, by the way, is the founder of nonviolent communication. I don't think I made that clear, but, um, but he founded it. He founded nonviolent communication in an effort to reduce violence on the planet. Um, and he was convinced that uh, it's, be it's precisely because we're educated in uh, a particular frameworks of thinking that, that uh, push us toward those things. Um, so if I can be convinced that uh, uh, oppressing uh, marginalized people is, uh, is good, then it's going to be much easier for me to violate those people's needs. Um, if I'm connected to my own needs and the needs of those people, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, and then in thinking about how to meet those needs, uh, I like to reference Angela Watrous, uh, who's actually my therapist, shout out to her, who says that it is precisely when we are disconnected from our feelings that our strategies most suck. Um, my favorite example of thinking about this is uh, if you think of like toxic masculinity and rationality, like, it, like, oh, those are just feelings. Like you need to think objectively. It's like, it's precisely the kind of people and I can make arguments about like disrupting that framework and that actually like when we're tapped into feelings, we're being more rational, but it's precisely those, the kind of framework of like, we need to be thinking about this objectively when we're doing the most horrible violent things and, and, and harming people. And it's for that purpose. It's, it, it's exactly an effort to disconnect from our feelings that are telling us 
this is wrong and this actually doesn't serve life. Um, so that's the idea there. Um, and uh, part of this is that everything that we do is being driven by uh, the impulse to, to meet our needs, whatever that is. Um, and uh, in that way, it's actually extremely important to sit in discomfort and get comfortable with discomfort. This is where the solutions discomfort part comes in, um, in that uh, if I am not addressing the feelings that are coming up for me, and I think like I've you know done the work, I've thought about it or whatever the case may be, um, then I'm going about my day being unconsciously driven by unresolved shit, right? Um, and uh, judgments are often an indicator that we're being overwhelmed by a feeling and we're trying to shut those off. Um, and in the context of the work that we are doing, of liberation work, um, that can come out in judgments like uh, that was racist or sexist or classist or whatever. Um, it doesn't mean that it that we are incorrect in saying that something is racist. I want to make that very clear. Um, and when we see something that is racist, uh, there is a way that we can say, well, that's racist, and then think that we're done with it, but it's still living inside us unresolved, and we're still carrying around that tension throughout the day. Um, so the point here is not that our judgments may be evil. The point here is that uh, the judgments can disconnect us from feelings and needs and we can we can still be correct in our judgments but we need to be connected to our feelings and needs to help resolve that tension so we're not being unconsciously driven by stuff that that may be actually be sabotaging our uh our strategies whatever they may be um this is i don't have a question i just think it's very uh the idea that like the idea that thinking about judgments as a way of like disconnecting from feelings and needs or trying to focus on what is objective um as a way of kind of like distancing oneself from feelings i just think is very useful to think about i agree and i thank you for saying so that's awesome um if there is nothing else um I'll, I'll briefly just go through how to distinguish what these things are. Um, uh, like what counts as a need, right? Like I have a lot of needs and everyone has a lot of needs, um, but how we meet them is where the, the conflicts happen. Um, so to, to be clear, a need versus a want or a strategy, how do we distinguish those things is based on the universality. So it's we consider something if it's universal if if everyone shares that need which is to say that they're not tied to any particular strategy or person or anything like that so for instance everyone on the planet has a need for independence and everyone on the planet has a need for connection and community um how much at any given moment will change and the ways that we meet those needs will change uh what are the most effective ways to meet those needs will change all the time um but uh, but it's the universality that determines that. Um, so uh, a car is a very popular vehicle ha, to meet uh, the needs of both independence and community. Um, and not every single person on the planet has a need for a car. Um, now there's a big, big asterisk here under capitalism, which is to say that the system of capitalism is very good at rendering, at alienating us from strategies that do not profit it, and is very good at rendering us dependent on strategies that do profit it. Um, and that is why every year we see a decrease in the number of uh, subsistence farmers who are uh, trying to meet their needs that way, and in fact even define those people as living in poverty. But then when we render them like off of the land and now they have to pay rent, but are now making more than $2 a day, we render them as having been saved from poverty. Then and we define that as a success. Um, and that's, that's the system of capitalism alienating us from uh, the needs that do not profit it. Um, and that is also why every year we see an increase in the number of fucking cars produced and sold. Um, 
And, uh, and it's because the, uh, the strategy of the car is one that profits the system of capitalism, um, at least under the system of capitalism, it profits it. Um, so there's a big asterisk in terms of uh, like what, is, what the system is working on us to do. And the idea there is that it's still very important to understand uh, what is a need or not because it keeps our options open. Um, I may well be correct in identifying that the, the best strategy I can make uh, is this particular strategy that I've decided. But as I pursue that strategy, things will change. And if I'm attached to that strategy, I won't see that things have changed. If I'm, if I'm connected to my need the entire time, maybe that strategy is the best strategy the whole way through and I'll just be connected to my need and all the better because I'll have even more enhanced feelings of joy when I meet the need or something will change. And then once that's changed, because I'm more connected to my need than to the strategy, I'll be able to shift and adapt more quickly. Um, awesome. Uh, how do we differentiate between observations and judgments? Uh, the biggest determining factor there is that uh, observations are falsifiable, um, which is, you know, a fancy science philosophy word for saying like it can be measured or not. Um, so, you know, to say, uh, I observe you being a piece of shit, that's not something I can measure, right? I can't say this is how much of a piece of shit you were. Whereas to say, uh, I, when you made this statement, I felt these feelings or whatever, or when you raised your voice, uh, it, it triggered these feelings in me. Like those are measurable things. Um, so that's, that's the idea there, is that the falsifiability is what separates an observation from a judgment. Um, and then going into feelings versus what we call non-feelings is the same uh, distinguishing factor. Feelings are, uh, 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 they're falsifiable in that, like, I can know that I am feeling, uh, and I stick with the four main feelings uh, to, to keep things simple and, and grounded. Uh, glad, sad, mad, and a frad, fear, right? And uh, I can know whether I'm feeling those feelings. But for me to say I feel offended or I feel abandoned or I feel insulted, is the big clue is the ED at the end, if it's a past participle, that's actually, those are actually judgments of what you have done to me. So it's a sneaky way of not taking responsibility for my feelings, right? Um, Marshall Rosenberg likes to use the example of ignored because there are times when Marshall Rosenberg is thrilled to be ignored and there are times when Marshall Rosenberg is very sad to be ignored um, and so by saying those things it's more uh, trying to put the responsibility of our feelings onto other people um, and so the part of this is that the more connected we are to our feelings the more uh, responsibility we have for them and that can be scary um, and uh, that's part of the growth, the growth work of emotional, emotional maturation. Awesome. Then uh, the big thing moving forward from there is that uh, how, so, okay, so this is all great. We have like this analysis or whatever, but I, now I need to go meet my needs. I need to either do something or I need to ask someone else to do something. So what happens there? Well, if you can do something, great. Get your needs met uh, without violating other people's needs. Um, and that's awesome. Problem solved. Uh, if, uh, if you need to ask someone to do something, now we're differentiating between what is a request and what is a demand. Um, in that case, how do we differentiate that? Is that a request comes uh, with the freedom to be declined and a demand comes with the threat of punishment uh, if, if declined. Um, and there, the nuance there is that uh, you can be making a free request but the person might still have a fear that if they decline, you will punish them. And, uh, and that comes from working that shit out. And especially if you have a history of punishing people if they decline and are trying to do the work to, to not do that, um, that will take some repair work because now people have that expectation already. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a big part of the tension of navigating this stuff is like, uh, people, people already are built in uh, uh, from the domination culture to expect punishment if we if we don't just uh, uh, 
consent to everything that, that is being asked for by us. We already think that people are out to get us um, that way. Um, and so uh, it, it takes work to genuinely convince people like, listen, like just a question, like you can say no, uh, feel free. Um, that said, you know, uh, is this a request or a demand? Uh, hey, would you be willing to do this for me? Take your, think about it and take your, take your guests uh, in your head. The answer is we don't fucking know, right? Because we don't know if that person is going to freak the fuck out if, if the answer is no, I'm not willing to do that. Um, whereas, is this a request or a demand? Would you get the fuck out of the way? Again, we don't know because the per, that may one may sound more like a demand than the other. But if the if if the person who says "Would you get the fuck out of the way" uh, is responded to with "No, actually, I need to do this right now," and they're like, "Oh, okay, whatever." Anyway, and then it was just the request that was phrased in such a way that it sounded maybe more like a demand. Um, but the truth is, we don't know except uh, in the response to a decline. Um, and there's a lot we can, we can get into on that too, but, uh, but that's, that's the big determining factor in request versus demand. Um, excellent. So, uh, if you're, if you're a writing person, then get whatever you need to write with. If, if you, uh, don't do that much and you can do these kinds of exercises in your head, no problem there. Um, but, uh, we're going to be looking at a conflict. So you can pick one. Um, and don't worry, you don't have to be sharing any uh, details about it. I, I actually ask that you do not do that. Um, so uh, confidentiality. Uh, don't pick anything too traumatizing, uh, just, just a conflict that you have had. I'm going to ask in this context that uh, ideally it's a conflict around your activism work um, that can be, you know, with uh, someone that like is the opposition or it can be uh, like someone you're working with around like a strategy or like an action or something, but you're having conflict with. Um, but, uh, but just imagine a conflict uh, that, uh, that has uh, some kind of activism context to it. Um, and give you a little bit of time to do that imagining. But if you have one and, and or while you're thinking of one, we're going to be thinking about what our feelings and needs are in this conflict. So if you're, if you're writing this, uh, you know, you can draw a line down your paper and write out what your feelings are. Um, and you don't need to worry about if their feelings are not in this moment, just kind of like, you know, vomit them out and then, you know, come back later and we'll, we'll go through that. Um, and same thing with the needs. You don't have to worry about if their needs or strategies in this moment. Don't, don't, uh, don't edit as you're writing your first draft. Just just get it out there and then look at it later with that that kind of uh, framework. We'll we'll parse that out. But take some time to about what are my feelings in this conflict? What's coming up? I'd like to start with those four, right? Those big four: glad, sad, mad, afraid. Um, and if you have words that you like, um, maybe you felt enraged. Um, which, you know, it has the past participle, but I think it makes it very clear what that feeling is. Uh, if, if you felt a deep, deep anger, if you felt uh, really, if you felt just deep, deep fear over what might happen, um, if, you, uh, if you felt some grief, uh, maybe it was a deep depression, whatever the case may be. Maybe for whatever reason, it happens in the conflict you felt joy and if that's there, then write it. As far as the needs, like maybe in that conflict, uh, you needed to be understood, right? That counts as a need because it's universal. If you, you not everyone has the need for a given person to understand us, but we all share the need to be understood, to be heard. Um, maybe there was some need for uh, uh, autonomy or agency that was violated whatever need might be coming up. And there are feelings and needs lists that we can look at, but I'm, I'm more interested in you, what counts as feelings and needs for you and what comes up for you and you developing your own literacy with it. 
So if you're still writing out your own feelings and needs, that's great. You can, you don't have to stop. You can keep doing that. I'll just add for, for others to think about and for you to think about when you get to it. Now we're going to look at what were the feelings and needs of the other person in this conflict or other people. Um, and, you know, we're not saying that you know for sure what their feelings and needs are. This is just guesswork. And that's okay. It is okay to guess. And it's okay to guess in the conversation with someone. If you're wrong, believe me, they will tell you. And if you have anything that you would like to share, um, not about the conflict, I'm gonna ask you not to do that. But if you have anything you'd like to share about uh, like what this exercise has brought for you, um, like are you seeing any patterns? Um, uh, has this helped you connect to your own feelings and needs or the feelings and needs of the other person? Um, so specific to that, I don't want to get into litigating a conflict about like, well, this person did this or said this or whatever. I can jump in if that's okay. Love it. Um, yeah, I noticed that when I was trying to name the feelings of the other person, I ended up uh, writing a list of needs. <laughs> um, like I, what I wrote was uh, security, clarity, control, stability. Like those are all things that I was like, wait a second, those aren't feelings. Mm. Um, and that was interesting to me to like realize that it was harder to to like name the feelings of another person and then I kind of slowed down to try to think about it and that was very helpful. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, do you, do you have a sense of where that's coming from? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I think that with this particular person, I feel like I'm not, I haven't heard this person name their feelings very much, and so it's hard to imagine what they are. But once I realized that I wasn't naming feelings, I did try to think what I would imagine they might be, and um, and like they came, they definitely came to me. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm right, but uh, yeah, I think that's part of it. That's cool. Yeah, it sounds like there is some uh thing there that is preventing a strong connection with what those feelings are um that i think sounds like it'd be really valuable to be mindful around like what what is that about and, and have and hold curiosity around that that's it's interesting for me to hear what i had to say because i feel like i had the opposite problem was I can identify feelings generally, but having the literacy around needs, I feel like is lacking for me. Um, it was a bit easier for myself, but especially for the other person, not feeling like I could dig deeper and underneath feelings to get to what that person is actually needing in this certain situation. Totally. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that. I couldn't figure out, like, I had lots of feelings and needs. And then I was like, I don't know which one, like, what's even feasible. And like, really, which one would go into which category sometimes. So I think sometimes it's like, I need, like, X to really feel X kind of thing. Um, and so I was like thinking about that and that was also like kind of hard to be like okay like that's like a feeling and sort of a need for maybe the other person too so I was thinking about that as well like that they can kind of be a little mixed sometimes or feel like they're a little mixed totally yeah 
um, I think of nonviolent communication um, as very dialectical in that there it's all uh, all these tensions are all playing out together and it's kind of like making sense of all of them um, and yeah I think uh, I think it is hard to to connect to other people's needs and to, to make sense of that and figure that out um, especially uh, with all the the disconnection that white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal domination culture wants to put on us. Um, and uh, and it, it takes that, that practice. Um, I will emphasize that like this, like basic four uh, category quadrant, uh, you can walk around the whole world with this framework and this will, will serve you well. Um, it can be in, in conflicts or in celebrations, right? You, you can have, uh, have a quadrant that's a bunch of pleasant things on it. Um, and, uh, and it will, I think, help you to connect to and savor those, uh, those pleasant things. Um, so it's, it's, we, we often talk about nonviolent communication as conflict resolution, because, you know, that's what gets a lot of attention. And uh, it's, it's a framework that still holds when we're in harmony as well. Um, cool. Um, moving forward from there, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about empathy and non-empathy. Um, so this emphasis on like a nonviolent communication approach, right, to empathy, um, means that like when we're offering empathy, uh, we're focusing on those feelings and needs, right? Um, so, uh, if someone is, you know, telling us something about something that they're experiencing, pleasant or unpleasant, um, these are some of the examples that we might use, uh, tried and true, solid ways to respond. So, it sounds like you're feeling blank, uh, or if we're not sure, we can ask, are you feeling blank? So, it sounds like you're needing some blank, or we can ask, are you needing some blank? Um, and that those are ways to uh, help ourselves connect to uh, what the other person is feeling and needing. And it also will help them connect to what they're feeling and needing, uh, which a lot of times we struggle with. Like some of the time, uh, the reason that we uh, need to vent so much is exactly that we're not connected to our feelings and needs. And we're kind of venting in order to like figure it out. Like what is happening in me? I don't even know. And I need to like, like spew it onto someone so that they can help me make sense of this, right? Um, and then that other response that I love so much that gets uh, under, under emphasized, under talked about is just being with them in silence. Um, maybe they actually don't want you to say anything. Maybe they just want you to sit next to them and cry or hold them while they cry or whatever it is. Um, and, or like, you know, being in uh, like a, a interpersonal, <clears throat> an interpersonal meditation thing where you're just sitting and meditating together in that silence and just enjoying and loving that, which is also beautiful. Um, but yeah, silence is a really wonderful empathic response um, depending on the situation. Um, some examples of non-empathy. Uh, I, I'd be curious what other, what, what y'all, what your thoughts are, if you can imagine ways that we respond to people that are not empathetic. Um, you can feel free to put those in the chat. Um, or if you, if you think of anything that I haven't written here, uh, you can give voice to that. Um, but these are some of the ones that I think are the most uh, common that I'm, uh, that I'm aware of and have seen. Uh, interrupting people is a great way to cut ourselves off from their own feelings and needs. There is a way to empathically interrupt people. That's a, that is a thing that Marshall Rosenberg and nonviolent communication talks about. So I wanna make space for that. But generally uh, a lot of uh, non-empathy and interruption overlap. Um, advising people, uh, right? oh, you have this problem. Well, sounds like you got to do this. And like, that's it. I don't have feelings about your experience. I'm just telling you what to do. Um, 
and then minimizing. Oh, well, that's nothing. Like, that's all right. That's no big deal. It'll all work out. You know, whatever the case, uh, one upping. Someone tells us about something, we say, oh man, that reminds me of yesterday. I went through the same thing, but like way worse than what you went through, right? Um, or psychoanalyzing, uh, wow, like you got some issues that like I am going to diagnose you with right now as a probably non-licensed person. Um, and, and these are my thoughts about your pathologies. Um, and uh, in this list, uh, finally, info mining slash gossip mongering. Um, so like, you know, uh, someone's telling us a conflict and we're like, wow, what, th what did they say? And like, and what do you think that's about? And like, oh, but you did this? Wait, like, tell me about that relationship. Like, what's going on there? Like, and, and all of that. Um, and if you have any others, I'd love, I'd love to hear them. Um, and I will say that there are times when some of these are appropriate. Uh, sometimes people don't want an empathic response. Sometimes they genuinely want to know what you think is the best way to go about this. And they're actually looking for advice. And most of the time that people say that they want advice, I find they don't. <laughs> because we are not connected to our feelings and our needs. So more often than not, what I find is that when people say they want advice and I hazard some things to think about for advising moving forward, if their response is to continue to talk about this, the thing that's upsetting them, that's usually an indicator that actually the, what they need is more empathy. If, if I say... Like if, even if they get the empathy, right? If I'm saying like, oh, so it sounds like you're needing this or like you're feeling a lot of this or whatever the case may be. If they say, yeah, like that's the thing. And, and they go more it is typically an indication that they need more of that, 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 that the need for the empathy has not actually been fulfilled. Um, but, uh, or, or it's like bringing up, you know, new feelings or whatever the case may be. I'm seeing a note in the chat. Uh, I've heard Brene Brown define compassion as being comfortable with your own darkness enough that you can sit in the darkness with someone else without needing to turn on the light, which reminds me of this. That's fucking beautiful. I do like Brene Brown. I have not heard that particular quotation. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, because if remember, judgments are typically indications of being, of, of disconnecting from our feelings, often for the reason that we're being overwhelmed by the, the feeling that we're trying to disconnect from. So if I see someone freaking out about some conflict, may maybe their conflict or their feelings are overwhelming me. And I'm like, wow, this person is like, uh, 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 you know, a horrible bad thing is this, this person, this horrible judgment is what I have of this person. And like, and if, that is a way that I can get my feelings to calm down because I'm too overwhelmed. And it's a way for me to self-regulate actually is what is happening there all, um, often, uh, a lot of the time. Um, so if we can sit with our own discomfort, that means that we are more resourced to offer these empathic responses to other people. I would love to be able to do the exercise is one called empathy, non-empathy, which is that you pick a conflict that you do feel comfortable sharing a little bit about. And in just like two sentences, you share what is going on for you. So it could be, yeah, I've been working really hard and I'm really tired and I, uh, I need some sleep. And you share that to the other person and You'll do that three times, the, just the same share each time. You say the same words um, or close to it or whatever. And then the first two times, the person responding offers a non-empathic response. So in that example, they might uh, advise, well, get some sleep, go to sleep early tonight. That'd be the advice response or, or whatever the other responses are. Like, that's nothing. One time I didn't go to sleep for five days, whatever. Um, and then the third response is the empathic response. And each time 
you just take a little moment after the response to register that and feel that and what happens in your body and, and uh, you know what what flashed judgments do you have of the other person who just told you the thing whatever it is um, if someone has a conflict um, this uh, whatever you feel comfortable sharing it, this one can or does not have to be activist themed um, whatever whatever you feel alive in in sharing and comfortable with uh, you can you can share and uh, any person will jump in and offer uh, first the first two times a non-empathic response uh, and it can be a different person each time uh, jumping in to, to respond however we want to do that I think I have one now <laughs> uh, so very brief context of the conflict I gave space for someone I used to be close with to talk about what happened with our friendship and they didn't really acknowledge what happened um come to find out later that some that they lied to me and that something is the matter but that they wouldn't tell me what was wrong um I bet it's like probably no big deal. Like she's probably not even mad at you. Excellently done. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, if you want to share the same conflict again, um, and and don't worry, whatever residual feelings you have from the response, like we'll debrief after the third one. All right, so somebody I used to be close with, I gave them the space to acknowledge what happened and share what was on their heart, and they pretended like it didn't happen, and come to find out later, there is something there, but they just didn't tell me. Um, so who did your friend tell about what actually happened <laughs> and what do you know? Nice. Uh, you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Um, and then one more time. One more sure. time. Okay. So somebody I used to be close with, well, we had a falling out and I gave them the space to share what was wrong and what was going on for them. And they pretended nothing happened. Everything was okay. And come to find out later that they lied to me and stuff was going on. Um, it sounds like you are feeling kind of angry with this friend. Is, is that correct? Beautiful. Um, you don't need to answer that question either. And the asking, the check-in, right? Is that correct? It's beautiful. Cause like, maybe she is, maybe she's having other feelings. We don't know. Um, excellent. Uh, so now uh, I'd love to hear from, especially you, but also everyone in how that felt for you uh, to receive and for people who responded, how that felt for you to respond with those different things that you responded to? I could definitely feel a difference between the non-empathic responses and the ones that did, the one that did have empathy. Um, when you did that last response of like, oh, so it sounds like you're feeling angry. Is that correct? I could feel that relief of someone's recognizing how I'm feeling and that I'm being understood versus the other two responses when you were saying like asking further questions that like was going to get me more fired up about it and like <laughs> even more angry which probably is isn't going to lead to a solution that's for sure and the first one when someone when it was that minimizing of like, oh, that's not even a big deal. 
I found myself wanting to do that judgment of like feeling like I feel offended, but that's not an actual feeling. Um, And just almost taken aback and hurt by the fact that they weren't acknowledging the frustration that I was having. Totally. Yeah, I think with with something like that, with the the data mining, um, I always think of like uh, an Alexa or an OK Google, as like because that's what they are, is data mining. Um, but uh, it's like the most valuable thing you told me about your feelings and experience is the the more information that I can extract from it for my own purposes, rather than like the fact that you have feelings about it, like that. Um, and then there, so that that's the implicit message there. And like we're we're often responding and communicating, uh, I'd say like perhaps more foundationally with the implicit messaging. Um, excellent. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from uh, the sh- the the responders. Uh, how did that feel for you to? to respond non-empathically versus empathically? Did you did you sense how your body felt? Anything like that? I definitely noticed that when, when I switched from trying to have an, a non-empathetic empathetic response to an empathetic response, um, There was just this moment of pause where I started imagining how I would feel in this context. And the the emotions that came up for me were, um, I'm wondering if you're feeling hurt or confused. And and just definitely had some body responses um, from that of just feeling like, like tenderness and my own feelings of when that has come up for me. And I, in contrast to when I was um, trying to come up with a non-empathetic response, I felt very numb and kind of disconnected when I was in that headspace. In the in the first headspace, not the second one. I was just kind of like in uh, redirect mode, which didn't let me feel. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I feel like my first reaction um, is to like, and like totally like well-intentioned, like I was kind of trying to be snarky in the first one, but like my first instinct is to like, I think get more information because I always feel like when like people talk to me about their conflicts that like I have to solve them. And now I know that that's like, First, I like try to get more information so that I can like assess the situation and then like give people advice on that, um, which are both just like non empathetic responses um, that came from like a super good place of like trying to help people, but like are most of the time not actually helpful and like not honoring people's like autonomy and like capacity to solve their own problems. Um, unless they like explicitly ask me like, what should I do? You know, but often they aren't. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I ask that you don't need to uh, beat yourself up or add an asking to any like realizations like that or anything like that. Um, we are trained in these non-empathic responses to be our instinctual responses. Um, there's a, a story, I want to say uh, he's a rabbi who you know, part of his line of work is to uh, be there for people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Um, and uh, the the story is that he then experiences the loss of a loved one and people are giving him these like reassuring like uh, comforts of, by saying whatever it is they're saying. And he had uh, like, a, on the one hand, one level of painful realization, like th- this isn't helping, this is actually like hurting a lot of what people are telling me. And then there was another level of, of painful realization of, oh my God, this is what I've been saying to people my whole career. 
and um, uh, what we we often think like there's an attitude I think that we need to like do something right um, that we can't just sit there um, with them in it and uh, and that that's part of that like discomfort then leading us to uh, choose strategies that are are not as connected um, and we can do all of this to ourselves. Um, if you think about like your own self-talk, like what is it you may say to yourself when you make something that you might call a mistake? Is it uh, any of these empathic responses? Is it any of these empathic responses? Is it uh, any of these judgments, moralizing judgments we talked about? Um, and do you create those enemy images of your own self? Uh, and what is that like? Um, and then finally, you spoke to, on the empathic response, receiving that, you felt a lot of relief. Um, that's usually a really strong indicator, is it uh, the, that release of tension in our bodies, that the, whatever like driving need was, was operating was met in some amount. Um, and so pay attention to those tensions. Where are we carrying those all the time, right? And there's no, there's no getting rid of them, right? The tensions are in our bodies. Our, our bodies are walking around. There's tension there all the time. It's always dialectical. Uh, so it's just a matter of being alive to them and mindful of them. And maybe you can't deal with them in that moment right then. Um, but the, uh, I, like, I really like to emphasize that you can be in relationship with yourself the same way we can be in relationship with anyone else, which is to say in this context, you know, if you have a friend who's trying to talk to you about a serious conflict and every time they try to talk to you about it, you're like, no, I, I can't talk about this. I don't want to deal with this. Like, no, no, no. Then eventually either typically two, one of two things will happen. One is the friend will leave you and you won't have a relationship anymore with them or at a point where maybe you are genuinely too busy to be focused on that. The friend explodes at you and now you have to deal with it. And just as that can happen with a friend of ours, that can and does happen with our own selves. If every time our body tries to tell us, hey, something's coming up and this is a conflict that you're going to need to deal with at some point, either the, our bodies are going to explode at us and we're going to have some kind of breakdown, whatever that looks like for us, or our bodies are going to leave us and be completely disconnected and alienated from our feelings and needs. Often that looks like a clinical depression that can manifest in a variety of other ways too, um, but that's one. Um, and neither one of those is very fulfilling or harmonious. Um, and that's what we're out here for. Um, yeah. So that is the bulk of this workshop in nonviolent communication. Um, we have a little bit of time left over for Q and A. Um, I'm sensing maybe that there aren't a lot of, the, the, there's not a asking questions group is my impression. But if you have any, um, please jump in with those. Otherwise, I can fill time with things. No worries about that. But uh, if you do have any questions, I would love to honor those. I do have a question. Love it. So you talked about at the beginning how you frame this as being um, like the social emotional left leftism and when we're talking about conflicts, doing it within this activism space. So I'm wondering your thoughts about how this can play out when we are doing organizing work and when we're in these communities of doing really exhausting work that feels really urgent and how do we still make space and create this culture of nonviolent communication and honoring each other's needs? Absolutely. Excellent question. Um, so a couple things on that. Uh, for one thing, um, this framework, like any conflict you have, um, it, 
it will be, I'm convinced, valuable for you to go through this for your own sake, even if you never have another conversation with the person you're in conflict with, whether that's the opposition or whether that's someone in the organizing circle um, that, that now you don't have a relationship or don't talk to anymore. Um, but that, that work of grieving that conflict, this stuff will help you metabolize that grief, even if it's not, a, the, the relationship is, is not there anymore. So there's always that, is that this work will help you metabolize whatever is happening and then you can show up better. Um, also, in the context of uh, organizing, um, in connecting to your own needs, you're going to help other people connect to their own needs. That's going to open up more creativity and strategies to happen. Um, and if you are not connected to your own needs, uh, then, if that's not what you're connected to, then I would guess you're probably connected to some strategies. And at that point, um, you might be overlooking strategies that are actually way more effective and way more um, collectively liberatory. Typically what happens when we're attached to strategies is that we're prioritizing some shit going on with ourselves rather than with the group, right? Um, the example I like to use uh, in this conversation is that, um, you know, I participated in a protest against uh, Richard Spencer talking on a college campus back when, you know, he was relevant to talking on college campuses. And uh, in the planning of it, there were a couple different strategies that people were putting out. There was um, like uh, droning out his talk so that people couldn't hear him. There was, uh, doing outreach in that area and like handing out leaflets and stuff being like, Hey, we do work against this. Like let's organize together. Um, there was, uh, uh, sabotaging the event so that he couldn't talk, um, in some way, there were ways we were thinking about that. Um, and then, and in addition to some others, there were also people who just really wanted to fucking punch Nazis and, I think that all of those are totally valid strategies. And uh, if like someone is attached to any of them, then it's going to, uh, to get in the way of like a, a comprehensive and holistic approach of like what is the most effective thing here? And how do we, maybe we can make all of these work, right? Um, and, uh, like how can we get them to work together creatively in, in, in a way that like supports all of each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, critiques of what happened and, and, you know, it's not like, not my special analysis. People wrote about what happened and, and, in, in within the group in very good ways and like, don't have to get into all that. But, uh, part of that I think is, uh, like, when, when we equate our own strategies with like the grander thing, like, uh, you know, like what, what we need here is this, because like, I have a strong need for, for justice, um, then totally into it. Love the need for justice. I share that really strong need. And I'm wondering like, may, is that like the most, is that the way that we can most contribute to justice or is it maybe this other strategy? And actually like you have some, some like other shit that you want to like let out because you're tired of carrying it. Um, which like, you know, totally valid to be sick of carrying some bullshit. I get that. Um, so that's, that I think is like one of the big ways that we can be using this as organizers is like when we're planning actions, um, and in communion with each other, how do we do that? So that we're not driven by stuff that's actually going to sabotage things. Um, and we're still connecting to each other, knowing that like, we're carrying a lot of fucked up shit around because that's what we're doing. That's our work. And how is that, uh, how are we helping each other hold, hold space for that while we're doing that? Does that address, get to your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. I like to check in. Good. Um, yeah.
I'll share some resources for y'all um, so that you can use these. Uh, the left-hand side over here is just some general political economy stuff. Um, so uh, it doesn't go into like the social emotional learning side of things too much, but I, I always love sharing these ones in particular. I think they're good, good frameworks. Um, shameless plug, the anti-socialism article, I wrote that one. Um, and there's some more resources in there too. Um, and then uh, the stuff on the right-hand side is more of the, the NVC stuff. And that has a mix of like more interpersonal, more institutional. Um, so there's the nonviolent communication book, classic. Uh, there's a workbook version of it too. Um, but that de decolonizing nonviolent communication, the workbook and the, the organization that puts it out called Trauma Informed NVC by uh, the, the person named Manachi. Um, excellent, excellent stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there is uh, a, a phenomena of NVC, like there, there, white nonviolent communication exists. That is a thing. Um, and uh, decolonizing NVC is very much not that and says, how do we get the whiteness out of this? Um, and at the same time, I'll also say like Marshall Rosenberg, the founder uh, is like aware of that stuff. And so I also share a number of videos from him that where he addresses that. So the NVC and money, talks about how nonviolent communication is inherently uh, a, a based in the economy, that we're not going to have capitalism uh, with, if, if we all adopted nonviolent communication, capitalism would crumble. Um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily like use the words capitalism, but uh, he says enough that like, yeah, dude's clearly an anarchist. Um, and uh, the NVC and the structural power analysis, a lot of the, like one of the thing, the critiques that nonviolent communication gets is that it's uh, gaslighty. It's like, oh, well, it's your own fault for feeling this way or whatever. Uh, and so uh, that's Marshall Rosenberg speaking to that exact thing. Um, and, and then the feelings and needs list is, is great work, uh, great, great reference for if you like are developing the literacy of feelings and needs. Um, social emotional learning for social justice, I wrote, uh, shameless plug there. Johan Hari is an excellent, uh, person to look to for this kind of stuff. He began his work because a loved one, uh, got into, uh, developed alcoholism and Johan Hari asked the question, how can I best support this person? Cause like, is it tough love? Is that the answer or is it holding space and and doing whatever it takes to help this person, whatever they say they need, or what, what do I do? And in uh, exploring that question became like one of the, the best people on the matters of public policy and how uh, the system of capitalism, especially neoliberalism is uh, connected to both drug addiction and, uh, and depression and how those things are deeply, deeply tied to each other. Excellent stuff there. Um, and uh, the podcast, Irresistible, formerly known as uh, Healing Justice, some good uh, ones an interview, ones a guided meditation um, stuff there. And then uh, Philosophy Tube, uh, an excellent YouTube account. That is a guided meditation uh, that it works uh, both ironically and unironically. I, I, it's one of my, it is my favorite guided meditation. I love it. Uh, it explores the question reform versus revolution in a dialectical feelings and needs way. And it's great. Um, and then uh, I'll, these slides are, I share with you. Um, so you can, I'll, those are all hyperlinks and you can click on them. This is just a reference sheet. We talked about uh, differentiating between observation versus evaluation, feelings versus non-feeling, all those things. Uh, just I statements are really good uh, in general to keep us rooted in ourselves and not in judgment of the other. Um, giraffe ears, I didn't explain that. Uh, giraffe ears are uh, what we call like when someone is talking to us in uh, what is not nonviolent communication, we put on our giraffe ears. Why giraffe ears? Because giraffes have the largest heart of any land animal. Uh, they need large hearts to pump the blood up their really long necks, hashtag structural engineering. Um, and uh, the idea there is that if someone says, 
uh, fuck you asshole, we can hear, wow, this person is uh, in a lot of pain right now. And it sounds like they're really needing some support. Um, and in that way, uh, right, if we, if we can imagine uh, like at the interpersonal level of liberation, if we can imagine like living completely liberated from judgment, if all we ever hear is someone's feelings and needs, we never hear judgment, it's never coming up for us. Um, and talk about the interpersonal liberation, if we can then do that to ourselves, right? So then if, if we make something that we might call a mistake and then we in our heads go, oh, you're so stupid, right? And then we take that moment with the drafters and go, wow, it sounds like you're really frustrated because like you really thought you had learned this lesson already and uh, weren't going to go through this pain again. Whoa, like I feel my body relax just at the thought of that because now I'm not walking around calling myself stupid. Uh, the formula there, uh, it's for, for practice. You don't have to talk like this NVC robot all the time, but when you're figuring stuff out, uh, when I see or hear you do blank observation, I feel this feeling. I need some blank. Would you please blank? Uh, that's that's the formula. Uh, that's how we how we ground ourselves, especially if we're not sure uh, where our grounding is. Um, and then there's something that I like to call step not. It's uh, the background intro. Um, Marshall Rosenberg, for however he came up with this number, I don't know. He says you get 40 words maximum or fewer to say this, but uh, you can say you know, growing up uh, m in my family, when we yelled at each other, it meant that there was like a serious safety issue. So when I hear you raise your voice, I feel super triggered and, and unable to connect to you because I'm needing some uh, assurance that like there is safety here. Would you be willing to say it could be the exact same words, just not with a raised voice, for instance. Um, and you know, I want to live in a world where we don't need to divulge our trauma to people to help them understand us. And it is true that divulging our trauma to people helps them understand us. Um, so, uh, you know, step not 40 words uh, it will help people be able to connect to the feelings and needs that you're sharing in that moment. Um, that's the resource guide through, walk through. Um, and I can share these slides in the chat right now. Um, but I have so appreciate and uh, I feel gratitude and joy and comfort that I can share these things with you because it, might, it meets my needs for um, uh, a shared reality and care uh, and uh, consideration that, um, and I'll also say uh, like, a, because I am convinced that this framework will contribute to the movement for collective liberation, it meets my need for justice uh, because I believe it will, it will help bring that about. And I thank you all for that. Well, thank you so much. Um, it was really a treat to tune in, so thank you. I would like to say thank you as well. I feel a lot of gratitude for you taking the time to explain this. And it's really great for it's before when I learned about nonviolent communication, it wasn't within this aspect of activism and social movements and collective liberation as much and wasn't grounded in this analysis. So I really appreciate you taking that into account and sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, uh, it deeply violates my needs that there are uh, social emotional learning courses, including nonviolent communication stuff that you can go through. And at the end of it, you will, you, you may well have never heard of a thing called racism. And I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, and uh, it, 
it's definitely I uh, feel enlivened that I get to share this with people with that frame. Um, I also want to express my gratitude, Pierce, for you being here. And uh, I, I'm just like, I really do genuinely feel so much, so much gratitude and, and connection and like appreciation that there is this shared reality that we can use together towards work towards justice. And I also have a lot of grief and sadness that there were not more of us on this call today and that there are so many places where these are not frameworks that are used. Um, and just sitting with that and sitting with like having a lot of needs that I know will not be met in some of the spaces where I spend time mm -hmm. overnight, but feeling grateful to be in a space where they are being met right now and hoping to to bring them to more spaces yeah totally thank you for that i appreciate that um i uh am excited that the recording can be shared with innumerable people um and so that's rad um and on the note of uh of uh yeah our needs not being met in particular spaces and in uh, it's true that our needs are not tied to particular people, and it is also true that sometimes, like, if one particular person would just say something or do something, it would go a long way to meeting our needs. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's easy uh, to get that need met elsewhere. Um, and I do like that it is possible, even if it will take more effort to meet that need in a different way from in different relationships. Thank you. I feel very gushy right now. This is great. <laughs>